In part one of how game developers implement physics in video games, we went over the various different types of physics engines, how they work and how they differ. We also went over the building blocks of what can make a physics engine more or less efficient than others, and how the long list of different styles over the years have ended up giving us the somewhat standardized approach to delivering believable realistic worlds where the physics makes sense that we enjoy today. Like with any other aspect of this conversation, there is always more to learn though, so without further delay, here's part two. Now that we have established the history of physics engines, and we have an understanding of what is expected of them nowadays, it's important to point out that while it may seem like physics in games are more similar than ever, the truth is there's actually so many more variables nowadays, and so many ways of managing these variables, that there actually is more to know now about these systems than ever before. And it's very important to not conflate standardization with simplicity. Obviously, the amount of data that one character model can contain is growing every year, as clothes, hair, weapons, items, skin, and other things are all now getting more attention and more freedom to exist independently alongside a character model, instead of just being a static part of the model itself. To make things infinitely more complicated, though, on top of all of the physics calculations that these engines have to make with items and characters in real time, Time, collision detection, how two or more objects interact upon coming into contact with each other is also a huge part of the equation. Once one single character model has been assembled with all of the joints and static rigid portions, how that model will react to objects it connects with and how those objects will react back to the character is, in and of itself, a massive portion of implementing convincing physics in video games. The detection of collusions, or hit detection to which it is commonly referred, is something that only a few video game physics engines had mastered before not too long ago. It is a system within game physics that determines how objects will interact and where the borders between those interactions lie. Hit detection or collision detection is very essential in determining how the game plays. When you strike an enemy in Diablo or when you're shot in Call of Duty, the quality of those moments will be determined by the quality of the hit detection within those games. In shooters, for example, hit detection is obviously extremely important, and the accuracy of the detection is determined by the boxes that targets and objects possess. I say boxes loosely because this is really a term that was invented back when they were literally squares in 2D games that would determine the borders that separate areas that can trigger an event and areas that cannot. These days, hitboxes can be a variety of complicated shapes to fit whatever object or character to which they are assigned. Hit detection in shooting combat is generally broken down into two possible methods of delivery, instant shots and delayed shots. With instant, the line of sight between one player and their target is determined instantly. If a target, whether that be an enemy or an object of importance or anything that is intended to be shot at any point, is determined to be in the line of sight at the moment of the player firing the weapon, then the target's corresponding animation will be displayed. If it's an enemy character model, it would be a death animation, or if the target was an explosive barrel, for instance, the explosion would be triggered. You get the idea. Once that hitbox is penetrated, the resulting animation is displayed whether it be a damage or a death animation or whatever it is. This is also referred to as ray casting in more technically savvy circles. The second method is delayed shots, which is more of a realistic method that is more and more becoming the standard these days, especially with hyper realistic shooters. Actual bullets, missiles, and other projectiles actually do exist in the world and move through the geometry of the game in real time, resulting in a much more realistic experience for the player. Whenever the projectile fired penetrates or touches the object, then the corresponding animation will be triggered just like before, but this way there are far more variables at play. Some games actually implement characteristics that can affect the trajectory of the projectile, like bullet drop, for longer shots to further add to the challenge challenge and realism, and this can make the experience really satisfying once the player masters these variables. Hit detection isn't just confined to bullets and targets though. It is essentially the entire foundation of implementing physics in video games in that nearly everything that happens in a game is some form of hit detection. Even just walking down the foggy, empty streets of Silent Hill is using some derivative of collision detection in that Harry Mason's character model is, in essence, hitting the layer of detail that is the road. The 
rules around even this simple form of detection must be determined to keep him from falling right through the pavement. So whenever you fall right through the ground in an alpha version of a game or in some hectic online experience, it's because something is wrong in that area, or at least it's incomplete, or it didn't anticipate whatever the variables were that led to that moment. The way these collisions are calculated and the sizes of the parameters that determine what is and is not hitting a target are often linked with how difficult the game is. Ever play one of those top-down bullet hell shoot 'em ups and breeze right through it even though you notice some enemy bullets grazing your ship? Well, that's because the hitbox was conservatively placed and is probably smaller than the actual ship itself. Bringing all of these variables to complete the experience of interacting with the game world is not a proprietary process per se, but essentially what we have covered in this discussion thus far is the situation that modern game developers face. Whether it be a simpler 2D game like Limbo, simple 3D games like Minecraft, or the complex landmark games that have defined their respective eras of game physics, they are all more or less subject to these basic confines and usually end up finding similar ways to navigate their game development within them. With a topic like implementing game physics, we could just about explore it forever as the rules and confines of what can be done are always changing to be more efficient and streamlined and allow more variables. Thankfully, the question of managing game physics isn't so much about what needs to be done anymore, but rather how it can be done. As games continue to evolve and the detail of those games follows suit, the amount of variables will certainly continue to grow and with that growth will come more realism and with that realism will come more spectacular experiences for us as gamers. While we may not all want to be saddled with the daunting responsibility of bringing all of these things together, we do all have a special appreciation for the games in which it is done well. And as long as the evolution of games with great physics continues to develop, we'll all be there to play them. And that about does it for this video. If you enjoyed what you watched and want to see more from Gaming Bolt, you can always hit that subscribe button and turn on the bell icon next to it. That way you will never miss any of our videos.